Hi, shalom, friends. Ah, the power of words. Everyone still could remember that timely compliment that changed their life, made them glow, made them feel good. And sometimes that compliment, if it's timely and earnest, it stays for a very long time. And heaven forbid, we should remember the negative of that uh, insult that we still cannot get over. Simple, simple um, voice waves, and yet they have such a powerful effect. So how strong are words? Let me tell you a story of how words saved a life. No, and it wasn't an eloquent speech. Six words saved a man's life. This story happened in our lifetime, year 203, first Iraq war, and with an American soldier who's Jewish, his name is Jordan Schultz. And this, this, this story he himself related, and it goes somewhat like this. Jordan grew up Jewish, but very ignorant of his background. They were nominally Jewish with uh, high holiday services, and that's about it. But he always remembered, and he was told that, that he's Jewish, and he grew up in Texas, and at the age of seven, strange things happened. He moved to Santa Fe, and in Santa Fe, Mexico, on his very block, lived an observant couple with a household full of children. And Jordan was very lucky because they had a boy seven years old whose name was Josh. And though one had the yarmulke and one did not, and one said Baruch Hashem, the other one had no idea what that meant, they became best friends with the bicycles and the playing a bull, and they really were tight. The families were very polite to one another, and the, the religious one had a, I believe it was a 12 or 13 year old girl named Rivka. And of course, where do you find a good babysitter? Well, someone that grows up with children, someone that loves children, and someone that you could trust. And here they were very lucky that their neighbors had a 13-year-old or 12-year-old girl, Rivka, who was the perfect babysitter. So indeed, Jordan was often babysat by Rivka. Now, children inevitably uh, feel more secure when they're with their parents. So putting the kids to bed was always a chore. And they were always nervous. And Rivka, uh, in order to calm them, used to tell them the following. We have a very special prayer. And if you say this very special prayer, God will watch over you. And he actually, she actually taught them the Shema. So before going to bed, Jordan would say those six words, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And with that, he would fall asleep. And she babysat often, and Jordan remembered these words, the Shema Yisrael. Well, uh, years passed, Jordan went to school, joined the army, and here we are in 203, and he's a gunner. There's a Humvee, and there is a platoon, and he's, on, uh, he's outside, essentially the one that's most unprotected, he's holding on to the gun, and they're patrolling. Now those of us that remember the news reports, remember the roadside bombings. So many terrible casualties happened because uh, the insurgents and the wicked guys, they would plant bombs. So driving a Humvee down the streets was always, always anxious. Uh, it was, there was always, always a lot of anxiety. And that, well, he's a soldier. They got used to it somewhat. And he's always looking. And in his words, one day, we're going down a, a street, and I had a premonition. Something was not right. It seemed to me that the street was less crowded than usual. People were maybe looking at me. Maybe it was my imagination. But I began to get a very, very, very uncomfortable feeling in my heart. And, and actually, I'm, I'm scanning, I'm looking, and from moment to moment, my premonition is growing stronger. And I had a strong urge to pray. Except I don't know how to pray. I don't know any Hebrew words. And then it struck me. I do remember some Hebrew words. I remember the Shema. 
Well, I'm not a total ignorant person. I know that when you pray, you're supposed to bow. So I was holding on to the, my gun, and I decided to say the prayer. So I bent uh, from the waist towards the floor, holding on to the gun, and I said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, and then, and all went black. And indeed, um, there was a, a roadside bomb. Many of his platoon members were seriously injured. He had shrapnel in his arm. He had one eardrum uh, that was uh, shattered or busted, with, or, and uh, a mild concussion. And he's recuperating. And as he's recuperating, he's trying to figure out what is it that he did that saved his life. And he realized very, very quickly, if he would not have been in the bowing position when the bomb went off, the shrapnel would have entered his chest, his neck, and maybe his head. Essentially, he would have been dead. And he realized that saying the Shema saved his life. And in army language, he said to God, I owe you a big one. But he was still waiting. Is that mean he's supposed to be religious? Anyway, he begins talking to God a lot more often. And very often it is, thank you, and keep watching over me and my buddies. Now two weeks pass when a, a tall fellow comes from, from the chaplain's office. And he says, uh, are you Jordan? Yeah. He says, the chaplain found this in his, uh, in his case, uh, being that you're one of the few Jews. He thought you might use it. And he gave him a standard army siddur. Well, Jordan looks up to heaven. I got the message. You want me to talk to you? I will. And of course, it's Hebrew on one side, English on the other side. And when he had a spare moment, he would say some of the English prayers. Well, God kept his part and watched over him. At the end of the tour of duty, uh, Jordan decided that he owes God something. And he wants to find him. Where do you find God? Well, the most obvious place would be in the Holy Land of Israel. So, he uh, goes to Israel. And he's enjoying the country and the falafel and the energy. And basically, he's trying to find God, but he doesn't really see much of God, not in Tel Aviv, not even in Jerusalem. So someone tells him, you know, you look, if you're looking for God, you should go to a yeshiva which is an advanced uh, study. So he asked for a yeshiva randomly, and they told him, oh, there's a, there's a large yeshiva on this and this corner. It has a lot of Americans. Maybe you'll find what you're looking for. He walks through the door, and he sees carbon copies. Everyone looks the same. They all have white shirts, dark pants, some with glasses, some without, some with beards, mostly without. And there's a noise of a language that he doesn't really know. And it's mostly Hebrew, just a scattering. He's, he's lost. This is where he's supposed to find God. I mean, this in the yeshiva, he had no idea of what to do next. Anyway, as he's standing near the door, a fellow who's in a rush, runs by and by mistake pushes him. So he turns around and he says, excuse me, in English. Jordan looks at him. And the fellow stops for a moment and spontaneously, Josh, <laughs> Jordan, yeah, believe it or not, of the, all of the yeshivot and in the land of Israel, way over 10 years had passed, he bumps into Josh, which happens to be Rifka's brother. The six words of the Shema, which saved his life, well, came from Rivka, and the rest of his life was going to be saved by Josh. Well, the rest is history. Uh, I, I don't know if he's married now. I saw the video where he tells over the story. He, he spent some time in yeshiva with uh, Josh, and he found God. And with that charming story, which happened in our lifetime, I leave you. And there are so many wonderful ideas we could glean from the story. One, obviously, is the divine providence, how God orchestrates events, and how, a, so to speak, a lost Jew is brought back through a childhood friend. 
chances are very, very, it's, it's a rare statistic. Okay, that's beautiful. But I think what's even, what touches me more is when Rivka was teaching the seven-year-old kid how to go to bed with a mantra. To say these words, you'll fall asleep, God will protect you. Did she have any idea of what she was planting inside of this man? This seven-year-old boy carried these six words, which essentially changed his life, and it changed his life by saving his life. So friends, you never know the power of prayer. You certainly cannot anticipate the goodness that could grow from a single deed. So let's pay attention to the small things in life, and with Hashem's help, we might be privileged to see the great things that come from it. Shalom.